Welcome to another episode of Greetings and Salutations. This is Wayne O'Connor from WayneO'Connor.com. May Jesus Christ richly bless you and keep you. You are, you are your father's son. You are your father's son in each and every way. You are his eternal paragon each and every day. All honor and glory to you. Oh, Jesus, Yahweh, Son. Yes, Jesus, you are, you are, you are, you are, you are, the Son. Greetings and salutations. This is Wayne O'Connor, and today is Saturday, the 13th day of January. Today's episode is entitled, Smoke, Mirrors, and Mystics, In and Not In the Kingdom of Jesus. I pray, Jesus, that you send out your angels to get this message out, according to to your timetable, to those who need to hear it. I also pray that in your name, Jesus, that there will be a binding of tormenting spirits that would blind the eyes and stop up the ears and close the hearts of those who are destined to hear this message and understand it. Thank you, Jesus, for your provision, protection, and wisdom for your servants. I would like to start this program out with a shout-out for Dr. C.K. Quarterman. I was once part of his team for a year or two and shared a paper at one of his Christian symposiums. I still visit his Fallen Angels face group, but I warned him when I met him that Jesus tends to loan me out on a short-term basis to different Christian groups or families, but only for a short time, and then he puts me on a different project. I still pray for Quarterman's ministry and his family daily, but I haven't been part of his team in years. I checked Stephen Quayle's YouTube videos last night and found an interesting video entitled Boom! Exclamation point! Exclamation point! Exclamation point! Mars! It was only about 15 minutes long. Tucked in the middle was a quote from one of Quarterman's books. Written in white text over a space background was a quote about comets that was from a book by C.K. Quarterman that I may have helped proofread. Comets provide the most convincing argument in favor of a destroyed planet. Comets cannot date back to the beginning of the solar system because they consist of evolved matter such as water, which cannot form in the void of space. Water can only form on the surface of a planet with an atmosphere. C.K. Quarterman It was exciting to see the good doctor's quote on a quail video. That has to be a watermark of some type in one's Christian ministry to be quoted in a legendary quail video. Talking about Steve Quayle, I think I own all of his paranormal Christian books. I have a spiral-bound 1997 edition of his Aliens and Fallen Angels, The Sexual Corruption of the Human Race. I figure, because of the binding, that it must be an early edition. The backstory for this purchase is as follows. I was working at a turkey store processing plant as a QA about 25 years ago. As I was making my rounds, an elderly gent that I had never met before came up to me and said excitedly, I was listening to the Coast to Coast radio show about one in the morning. There was this guest on named Steve Quayle. He was talking about giants, aliens, and fallen angels. It was really interesting, end quote. He handed me a wadded-up sheet of yellow sticky pad paper. He added, quote, I really felt like I was supposed to give this to you. What's your name again? End quote. I told him my name, Wayne O'Connor, and he excitedly continued, quote, Anyway, Wayne, this is the web address to where you can buy the books from Steve Quayle. I really think you are supposed to buy those books. End quote. After I had gone home, I fired up my computer and found the site with the advertisement. I think both the giant book and the corruption book with postage was over a hundred dollars. There is no way I thought that I'm going to pay that for those two books. I don't care how good they are. But I just couldn't stop thinking about them. Finally, after two or three weeks, I threw up my hands and said, Lord, you must really want me to buy those books. 
I just can't stop thinking about them. And then I got out my credit card, and I went to the website, and I ordered them. And then I had peace. It must have been a week or two before the books came in through the mail. I had had an interest in the subject for decades, but until then, I hadn't had access to top-notch research materials, especially from a Christian perspective. Once I had the books in my hands and started reading, I felt they were worth the price. Quayle puts extensive research into his work, and his footnoting is very extensive. His books are not small. When he writes, Quayle writes thick, massive, eight and a half by 11 libraries. He writes libraries, not books. Libraries. <laughs> the price evened out over time. I bought a few books directly from Steve Quayle over the years, and sometimes he had some specials. Uh, but I also bought a few used copies through Amazon for anywhere from a buck to $20. I thought that uh, the old gent, actually his name was uh, Kurt Stokel. I had to go look it up. I had forgotten. Uh, after that, he did become a friend, and I thought maybe he just was pushing me to get the books so that he didn't have to buy them himself. But he never actually read the books. I mean, he wanted to look at the covers and see how thick they were and you know, look at a few pictures. But he ended up dying of a um, brain tumor, oh, I don't know, four or five years after that, or maybe even less time than that. Kurt was always the person who didn't really care to read if he didn't have to. He wanted to listen to it or he wanted to watch it. Audio and video, that was his thing, not print, especially fine print or lots of print. Anyway, all of this uh, reminds me of another quail story that's personal to me. He doesn't know about it, I don't think, anyway. When I was writing my book, Kingdom Lessons 4, I had a dream In that dream, an unknown author and Christian personality accused Stephen Quayle of plagiarism, and Jesus defended him in the dream. My character in the dream was probably too diplomatic, but defended him as well. The dream may be found in chapter 1 of my book, Kingdom Lessons 4, which is available at Amazon.com. Well, enough chatter. Onward into tonight's topic. I have another Christian writer and speaker on my Facebook friends list. His name is Jim Wilhelmson. Interestingly enough, I had just written a letter to a Christian friend, and the topic of our discussion came up on Jim's timeline. And this information is excerpted either as a paraphrase or as a direct quote from Jim Wilhelmson's timeline on Facebook on January 12, 2018. Jim was talking about a video that I had just referenced in writing a letter to a Christian friend. I wrote on Jim's feed concerning the topic, not that I had written to a friend, but just some comments on the topic. And it is a close paraphrase and not an exact quote. I changed the wording a bit to make it fit better for the radio show presentation, but it's pretty close. I will do the same later when I share the letter I wrote to uh, my Christian friend. But anyway, the uh, post started out with a little video where allegedly Oprah Winfrey said, uh, quote, old white people just need to die, end quote. And I wrote back, or under that posted topic, quote, Snopes says this statement, old white people just need to die, which is documented uh, in the video, is false. If you do the research, you can find the video yourself, and it shows Oprah say that quote, although not verbatim. But if you take the information around that section of the video, you can create a very accurate paraphrase that says just that. So technically, it is a misquote, but one of the most accurate misquotes that I have ever read. End quote. My post. Jim Wilhelmson replied, Quote, keep in mind that Snoops, and I thought it was funny that he called them Snoops, <laughs> is run by a couple supported by the Democrats. They are just as reliable as CNN. But it would not surprise me if embellishments exist on both sides of the political spectrum. Not all conservatives have the integrity that the indwelling Holy Spirit can give you if you are born again. Thanks, Wayne O'Connor. End quote. I really like Jim's statement that, quote, 
it would not surprise me if embellishments exist on both sides of the political spectrum. Not all conservatives have the integrity that the indwelling Holy Spirit can give you if you are born again. End quote. Jim was absolutely spot on with that assessment, according to my opinion. A few posts later, a lady messaged me under my comment, and she said that Snopes is a left-leaning group that has issued many politically motivated statements. And I clicked a like under that comment and responded, quote, Snopes pretends to be a fact-checking site, but seems to be more of a political propaganda platform for spinning protective cover stories to denigrate unfortunate truths that have been revealed by whistleblowers and truthers. And that's the end of my quote. A bit later, Jim posted to a man who seemed to be defending Oprah's alleged statement by saying that she had not used the words, quote, white person, unquote. Jim had responded, quote, if you can even trust the clip, it was not necessary, as in context the implication was those who were baked into the beliefs of that time, obviously whites, end quote. Anyway, I found it very interesting that the issue that I was discussing with a Christian friend via letter at that time came up on his Facebook page around the same time. That is, Jim's Facebook page. I have several of Jim's videos and his book, Beyond Science Fiction. I highly recommend his work. I have heard that Jim is working on a second book or an expansive new edition of his first book. Either way... I will want to get a copy for my library for my research. In just a minute or so, I will be including an excerpt from my recent teaching letter to a Christian friend. While I try not to shy from uncomfortable topics, I do try to be diplomatic. So much so that uh, many of my friends will, what is the word that I'm looking for, chasten me for being diplomatic? As is generally true, I have Christian friends who are passionately polarized on diverse sides of various topics. My friend, while a Christian, as you will see, is an avid Oprah supporter, and she's very excited about the upcoming presidential election in a couple of years. Concerning Oprah, some of my Christian friends love her, and others speak of her as a witch or a willing and zealous tool of devils. I get caught in the middle and end up being flogged by both sides for not being wholly and squarely aligned with them for or against Oprah. As promised, here is a section of my letter to my friend. Quote, Interesting that you posted about Oprah Winfrey and her upcoming potential presidential bid. My mom used to watch her show almost every day. Only Hee Haw or Little House on the Prairie would have precedence over it. I watched it often myself until I was about your age. There is no doubt that Oprah has been a great advocate against social injustice for women, children, minorities, and the poor for decades. And even though it wasn't displayed in the video, most of the time, I think, she had shows that uh, defended elderly people, no matter what their race. Just had to put that in there because I think it's a fair statement. I also have liked some of the movies she starred in and produced or consulted. That she has been a hope for many and has many great deeds on her resume is a fact that cannot be disputed. Of course, it's also true that uh, Christians can find information about Oprah that one may consider to be just the opposite. And I think that it's fair to mention that. It is understandable that many people love and adore Oprah. There are also many Oprah bashers. As with most things, like I said, I get caught in the middle, receiving the ire of both groups, because I tend to try to see things from a balanced perspective. Because Oprah is so well-liked and so famous, when she talks about spirituality, many of her admirers take her beliefs as gospel, even when it disagrees 
with the gospel, the genuine gospel of Jesus Christ. Not that I am a grand master concerning spirituality, although I am far from being a novice. Years ago, I noticed that she has a different take on many Christian beliefs. And I'm amazed at the number of people who do not question those beliefs. They just gobble them up like their favorite dessert or fast food, and they ooh and they ah, and it becomes a new gospel that erases what they may have learned about the genuine gospel of Jesus Christ. We all have little differences of opinion on many scriptural matters, and there is room for that in many instances. On the other hand, there are basic scriptural tenets that are not as open to a variety of interpretations. While I admire Oprah greatly, and may even get excited to see her in a movie, because I can see that her beliefs concerning spirituality on many of the basics are not accurate, I tend to be wary of getting too enamored of her. I know that you, my friend, like to do research. If you dare, you should try to search whether Oprah believes the Bible is the inerrant word of God or just a compilation of myths and historical events. Or you could do an internet search for whether she believes Jesus is the only way. Or if there are many religions, according to Oprah, that will get you into heaven. If the Bible is true, and I believe with all of my heart that it is true, then we just can't ignore the following verses, and I will read them out of the King James Version, unless otherwise noted. Well, let's start with Isaiah chapter 44, verse 6 from the Old Testament. Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last, and beside me there is no God. Matthew chapter 25, verse 41. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. John 1.1 1, 1. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God. And the Word was God. John chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. John chapter 3, verses 16 through 18. For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. John chapter 3 verse 36 he that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. John chapter 5, verses 22 through 24. For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son, that all men should honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. He that honoreth not the Son honoreth not the Father which hath sent him. Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word, and believeth on him that sent me, hath everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, 
but has passed from death unto life. John chapter 10, verses 6 through 10. This parable spake Jesus unto them, but they understood not what things they were which he spake unto them. Then said Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved, and shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief cometh not, but for to steal, and to kill, and to destroy. I am come, that they might have life, and that they might have it more abundantly. John chapter 14, verse 6. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Chapter 4, verse 12. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. Romans chapter 10, verse 9. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. First Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. These verses talk about how Jesus is real or that he is the only way. And while the Lord may use other Christians, men, women, circumstances, to preach to you the gospel of God or work with you on becoming more and more like Christ. We can't get into heaven based on our parents taking us to church. It can be used. It can be helpful. We can't even get to heaven because we go to a certain denomination, Catholic or Protestant. We can't get into heaven because we have a great orator, or a good fatherly minister, we can be helped. God can use them. And, of course, we can't get to heaven because of Jesus' mother. And she's not a fourth God. She's not part of a quadrinity. But Jesus loved his mother very much, and he honored her very much, and there's nothing wrong with giving Mary honor. But not a good thing to worship her. You can talk it away or justify it all you want, but it's not. But the whole point here is that there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. These verses talk about how Jesus is real or that he is the only way. And you're either going to believe it or you won't. But that is what the word says. There are many voices out there saying things that disagree with these verses or other biblical principles. Part of growing in Jesus is learning to discern between the Bible and voices out there in the world, in the world around you, that are coming out of the radio, the TV, magazines, Facebook, your friends, people you admire, actors, politicians, even ministers of the gospel. Many of us say we are Christians. Hopefully, when we say that we are Christians, that means that we are saved and following Jesus. Many of us may go to church almost every Sunday, but rarely read the Bible ourselves and rely on whatever we are told. While it is good to listen to teachings and sermons, we need to study the Word ourselves and get to know Jesus personally rather than just hear about him. Some of us promise ourselves to spend more time reading or fellowshipping with other Christians, but then only do so rarely or just go through the motions when we do get together. You know, and that could be whether we're getting together to pray to God by ourselves or, you know, with our brothers and sisters in Christ. 
We can't just go through the motions. The time's getting too dangerous. If you know scripture, then you know that Jesus had to die on the cross and be a sinless man to give us the right to ask him for forgiveness. If Jesus did not die on the cross, or he was not sinless, Jesus would not have been eligible to be our sin forgiveness offering to God the Father. You should do an internet search, my friend, and see if Oprah believes this or believes something else. There are actually ministers of the gospel, like Joel Osteen, that will agree with Oprah. He is gifted, eloquent, and has great skill as a motivational speaker. Yet, he will preach things that are contrary to the Bible. I think there are times that Oprah means well, my friend, but she may unknowingly be saying things that aren't true. Unfortunately, there are those who should know better but they do it for fame, fortune, and control. Also, most people don't realize that there is a cost to becoming a politician or TV personality. To get anywhere as a national-level politician or actor, there are rules you have to follow and promises you need to make. And if you don't follow through, the elite have enough power and influence to make you or your family suffer. Now, Jesus is all-powerful, And there are certain people who have a right heart and God is using them and he protects them. But that's not always the case. If you do the research, you will find that most actors or politicians have to make contracts with satanic entities. Too many say, that's not true. Oh, that's just a conspiracy theory. There's nothing to it. And yet there are singers and politicians who are very forthright about the fact and have went on the record to talk about the reality of Satan and the power they traded or contracted with him to get where they're at. The Dark Kingdom servants, whether fallen angels, devils, or humans, who are trying to rule the world behind the scenes for Satan, are very busy with many projects to bring the earth more fully into their master's control influencing or forcing human servants into spreading a false gospel that is really a new age gospel is one of those projects. It's on the front burner, and it's been on the burner for thousands of years, and maybe more. Whether they realize it or not, many actors, singers, and even television preachers have been captivated and preach a new age gospel that confuses Christians and non-Christians alike. If they can succeed in getting famous people to preach a doctrine that sounds like scripture but teaches that the Bible is not accurate or that you don't need Jesus or that you can be your own God, then they have succeeded in their nefarious goals. And even if you are your own God, it will be a God with a small g. Even Jesus said that ye are gods. If you're one of those people who say, that there's not in my Bible. If you take the time to go to John chapter 10, verse 34, or Psalm 82, 6, you will see that the Bible does make reference to small g gods. It's right there in your uh, scripture, although you may not have heard of it. If we don't surrender lordship to him, and there's a grace period on that, and he works with us, but if we don't surrender lordship to him, We can be a God with a small g. Or, even though there are many people that say, oh, that's unscriptural. If you look at both scripture and history, you see evidence that there were many gods with a small g. And some of those are famous gods of myth and history. And others can be just idols that we create because we love something or crave something more than having a relationship with Jesus or We give them more honor, spend more money on it, and more time. Those can also be gods with a small g. Either demonical fallen angels and other celestial entities, or just idols that we make from the world around us and from our interests. If they succeed in teaching you or letting you come to a new enlightenment that the Bible is not accurate, you don't need Jesus, and that you can be your own god, then they have succeeded in their nefarious goals. 
Some of these preachers or social justice warriors know exactly what they are doing. Others have been deceived and don't really know any better. Their motives may be to help and encourage, but the enemy of our souls is not afraid to use their ignorance and compassion for his own ends. One of the simplest ways to guard against this is to read the scriptures over and over. I don't know if any of you have ever worked at a bank. I'm sure someone who listens eventually will be a bank worker of some type or another. One of the things a cashier has to do is count real money over and over for weeks. Once in a while, they may have a symposium on counterfeit money, but mostly they just count the real money so much that they instantly spot the fake because it is different than the genuine. This is why it is so important to spend lots of time reading the Word and getting to know Jesus personally. If we rarely read our Bibles or rarely pray for Jesus to develop discernment and wisdom in us, we tend to totally miss it if we hear spiritual teachings that are contrary to the Bible. Because you have so little time, my friend, maybe the research seems too daunting. Since there are Oprah bashers out there who will take things out of context or scandal writers selling their program, it is best to find actual videos or document sections rather than just relying on a meme that you might find on Facebook or someone's personal ministry video or political video or whatever. And fact-checking agencies are often so politically correct or motivated that they have been caught fabricating. Snopes is a prime example. If you find the time and are brave enough to look for the truth, my friend, you may end up going through a paradigm shift. I know I have a few times in my past. Ellipsis points. End quote. Please note, I did do a little ad-libbing during the radio show in the center of that quoted material. From the letter to my friend. Yes, my listeners, I have gone through such paradigm shifts and encountered a change of heart on more than one issue. At times it has been a slow and awkward transformation. Other times it has been quick and even caught me by surprise. Once again, I was really impressed by Jim Wilhelmson's comment, quote, It would not surprise me if embellishments exist on both sides of the political spectrum. Not all conservatives have the integrity that the indwelling Holy Spirit can give you if you are born again. If we are born again and are allowing Jesus to transform our characters, we should not be surprised that we need to temper our candidness with understanding. And compassion. Even Jesus saved his most scathing rebukes for hard hearted Pharisees and was often very diplomatic and understanding while being frank with unconverted sinners and common people. Two wrongs don't make a right. Cliche as that is, it's true. If pagans or immature Christians use harsh language or violence when confronting mystics, That does not give us the right to do so as more mature followers of Jesus. We should know better. Or if wayward brothers and sisters, talking about Christians here, not pagans, discourse passionately, but do so with harshness, lack of compassion, or with vile words and actions, it makes a lot of enemies and it defames Jesus himself. There is often a fine line, I'll admit that, We need to be frank and candid and not hide away from saying the truth. But we also need to be sensitive as to when we speak the truth and model compassion. Just to clarify, I'm not suggesting that you use deception or lie. What I'm saying is that sometimes, instead of being blunt in a way that may seem caustic, uh, to wait until you know that the other person is calmed down and receptive. There's no use in wasting your breath and there's no use in inoculating them against uh, the time when you are going to provide spiritual wisdom. Especially as mature Christians, we need to be careful.
It doesn't give us the right not to speak the truth, but we need to be careful and we need to be sensitive with timing. You know, whether we're talking with ignorant Christians or well-meaning Christians or pagans, and sometimes we can think we're right and we're dead wrong. Jesus did wield a whip, perhaps even twice, and toppled tables in the court of the money changers and sacrifice sellers in the temple. He was not happy with such abuses in his father's house. He called Herod an old fox, which was considered an unclean animal in Jewish culture. Now, in our culture, it sounds like Jesus is saying he's wise. And that may have been in there a little bit. I believe, though, that when Jesus said this, it was more in the tone of the unclean animal, as was the culture of the time. Jesus would, on occasion, have harsh words for rigid religious elites. More often than not, Jesus was compassionate and understanding rather than righteously angry. We can be righteously angry as Christians, but more often than not, when we use that excuse or quote that verse, we are often justifying soulish carnality or lording it over our brothers and sisters. That is something that Jesus does not like. Well, folks, that's it for tonight's show. Pray for discernment as much as you pray for wisdom, protection, and provision. Unless I miss my guess, no matter what happens, 2018 is shaping up to be a rough and bumpy camel ride for Christians and pagans alike. So keep close to God, read His Word, think about your priorities, ask the Lord to reveal your motives during this coming year, because it's important. I'm not saying that we're going to have a war, although the Lord has shown me that civil war is coming. When? I have no idea. But we need to be prepared. You know, no matter who's the president, no matter who's in Congress, no matter who our preacher is, or no matter who we listen to on the internet or on TV or on the radio, as far as Christian teachers, Jesus is our teacher. He's on the throne. And as much as we may not like it, and we have the responsibility to be praying, you know, even for political leaders that aren't Christian or don't act like Christians sometimes when they confess to be Christians, uh, we're still responsible to be praying for the issues and for the situations. And we are responsible to remember that Jesus is in control. And yet, free will can get in the way. And there are certain things that, according to prophecy, they have to come. We may not be comfortable with it. We may not like it. But in their time, certain things have to come. And in the meantime, we have to occupy. We have to be responsible in our spheres of influence for our family, for our brothers and sisters, to do a good job at work or you know, whatever the case may be. But our priority, of course, has to be Jesus and serving Jesus and submitting to him so that we grow in wisdom and understanding and grow in maturity, not just stay baby Christians who whine and pout and, and want their way. But like I said, that's the end of tonight's show. Thank you for listening. May Jesus be with you. You are, you are your father's son. You are your father's son in each and every way. You are his eternal paragon each and every day. All honor and glory to you, O Jesus, Yahweh, son. Yes, Jesus, you are, you are, you are, you are your father's son. Anyway, this is Wayne O'Connor from wayneoconnor.com blog, wishing you a good day or a great evening, whatever the case may be. Thank you for listening. See you next time on Greetings and Salutations Radio Show. And visit me at wayneoconnor.com.